Hey y'all, Coach Fry, you got Stacy and the twins with me. Hey y'all. Hey, hey, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about how the language that we pray in affects our emotional dimensions and psychology when it comes to divine things. How it affects our feelings. Right. Um, the purpose of this is to show that the language that we think in is the language that we pray in. And the language that we pray in if it's not adequate, can put up barriers in our understanding that helps us or makes us to where we can't understand what we're truly praying about or praying to or praying for or all of that. Our words are limiting our prayer, our ability to pray the way we want. You know, I'm glad you said barriers because um, I was thinking that you were going to say that uh, they stop us. I'm praying correctly, but um, I think, you know, I agree with, it's more so barriers, you know, not giving us the, uh, what what would you say, the full effect of uh, the power of the prayer. Right. Well, let's go ahead and go down through some of this study right here. We looked in a lot of different documents, um, historical um um, scriptural to back up how praying in a pure language would help mm -hmm. our relationship with our Father, our Father. Our... Let's, let's go ahead and read some of this. Okay. Introduction. The language of prayer encompasses profound psychological and emotional dimensions. Each letter's meaning in sacred languages can significantly shape the experience and efficiency of prayer. This chapter explores how the meanings of specific letters influence psychological states and emotional responses, providing insight into the potential effects on personal and communion spiritual practice. See, because you remember each letter has a meaning. And as we're praying, this meaning is resonating on our minds or, mm -hmm. but definitely our spirits. And so if we're praying in the wrong language, like we said, this could be limiting what we're saying or what we're trying to say. So when we're praying, we're actually thinking about the meanings of what we're saying. All right. Right. The following table summarizes the meanings of letters and various deity names and examines their psychological and emotional implications. Now, this is one of the last reports that I got out of this. I decided to put it first because I thought it would you know, hold people's interest longer. Um, but after a lot of a lot programming, so to speak, I got it to where... I could put in English words or, or words that we say in English or the way we say them in English phonetically. And then he translated them back to the Hebrew and then told us what the name meant. Like, for instance, the name Abba. We recognize that as father. Mm -hmm. right? But I didn't tell him that. Okay. I didn't tell him what it was. I told him it was an unknown deity. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know if this unknown deity had this particular name. Mm hmm. And I used this name when I prayed. What was my expectation from this individual, positive and negative? So you just put in the letters that we know of as A and B. You Which didn't put Abba. in A, B, B, A. Right, because that's not okay. the name. The name is just A, B, Abba. Okay. If I had to put additional letters, it would have changed the name significantly. Or if you would have put in A B B A, it would have recognized that as the one that you know many other groups use and gave you maybe the information on that one. No, what what is A B B A? Like Abba, is that Abba? No, he would have did the same thing. He he didn't recognize any of them um, because I made sure he didn't. When he would try to recognize words in there, of course he would try to give it that connotation. Like when he would recognize Abba. He would try to give it the connotation as if it as if I was talking about our father. Mm -hmm. And I made it clear, no, don't assume this is our father. Just assume that it's two random letters that I choose to call him. Like you were um, had your own God or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. And the name and I was getting to choose the name of my God. 
And so the purpose of this report is what can I expect out of my God, depending on what name I called him. Abba opposed the Father. Okay. Yahushua opposed to Jesus. Right. Um, God opposed to Creator or something like that. And we'll see a table here. Okay. Matter of fact, let's start with, with AB, which we know is Abba. You can talk about the uh, little bit about the meaning of the letters and then the positive and negative attributes. Okay. Olive meaning is unity, divine breath, while bet means creation, container for divine presence. So that's what the two letters mean individually. Separate them out. That's what they mean. Mm -hmm. So you have to of course, put them together when you want to create a name. Right. So with the name Abba, let's look at the positive attributes that we can expect. Not what he said he was going to do. Not, you know, this is not based on him and what he's saying. This is based on our psychology and how the words are resonating on our minds and our hearts when we say. It. So I asked him, what can we expect? Not what he is or who he right, is. Right. But just based on the letters alone. What is the psychology doing to us? Okay. So check out the psychological and emotional impact. So the positive effects would be foundational strength, creative power, and presence. While the negative traits would be potential rigidity or overwhelming presence. Now it's real easy to accept the positive traits. But... It doesn't take much effort to accept the negative traits because it's saying potential rigidity. Now, some people will see that as a problem. Right. But we don't. He is our father. Mm -hmm. You know, we're expected to do what he said. That's the rigidity part. And then you have the overwhelming presence. Right. What we'll find is some, that some of these other names create a distance while the name Abba is making it so personal that there are some in the world who will see this negatively and say that he has an overwhelming presence. Yeah, I was thinking, mm, that's a good thing. We're used to that. That's what yeah. we want. But, you know, I could see how if this is uh, believed to be a ne negative, another God, it could be um, an overwhelming presence could be something that you don't want. Well, he, by default, he wanted to combine the names and just look at the positive attributes. Mm -hmm. And... He was almost ignoring the negative ones or softening them in the statement to identify the positive ones. So I made him split them up, both okay. positively and negatively, so that we can see the limitations. Okay. Right? Well, like we said, that one is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. I think everybody can accept that that's who Abba is. Right. But well, let's look at Father. Now, Father is what we say in English when we say Abba. Right. Fa, fa, ra, Father. Mm -hmm. So, what is it? Okay, for the character Pi, is speech and revelation. Tav is completion and truth. And Resh, meaning leadership and headship. Okay. So, when we picture our father in our mind, we can look at the traits to see who we believe he is. Positive is the ability to reveal truth, guide, and provide completion. Yeah. Well, you, while you, negative. Go ahead could be authoritarian or overly critical authoritarian or overly critical and this is coming out of the names mm -hmm. right you see in the name you see tau which is completion and resh which is leadership mm -hmm. and so that's where he's getting that from overturn authoritarian or overly critical right and even in the word speech we're getting the critical part right but we see a stark difference between Father and Abba. And again, that's the purpose of this video is so we can bring out these differences. So you can compare. Abba, you have strength, creative power, and presence. While Father, you have ability to reveal truth, guide, and provide completion. Abba, you have a potential rigidity or overwhelming presence. While Father, you have authoritarian or overly critical. Right. So let's go on and look at some of the next ones. Now the next one, you recognize that name? I do not. This, mm -mm. I don't. That's Jesus. I was gonna say that. <laughs> Why didn't you? <laughs> I wasn't for sure. I looked at that one and I was like, well, maybe that one's Jesus too. 
Yeah, I no, you're only looking at the letters. Don't do not do like he did and try to make assumptions uh -huh. and look at the name. You're only looking at the letters. Y, that's a J. Mm -hmm. S, that's S. Yeah. And S, that's S. Okay. So G, S, S. Okay. It would be a J, S, S, but there is no J in the Hebrew alphabet. Right. That the, the J and the Y are interchangeable in other languages. So that's his name. In a Hebrew mind, when you're thinking or praying, because the divine letters have so much of an impact on us psychologically, when you say Jesus, this is who you're talking about. So you want to break it down? The Yad means divine will, essence of creation, while Shemek means support, stability, while the repeated Shemek emphasizes ongoing support. Okay, so those are just the letters, and of course, it means something more significant when you double two letters. If if one letter is resh, which means head. If you put two reshes together, that's the head of the head. Okay. The positive traits are reliability, stability, and protection. And that's what they expect out of people who use the name Jesus. That's what they expect, right? Reliability, stability, and protection. While the negative traits are potential inflexibility or excessive control. I can't really see that one in it. Right. But it's definitely there in the, psych in the psychology. Mm -hmm. And now that I think about it a little bit, it could be how, you know how people who consistently use that name will consistently use it. In other words, they want no other name. They will recognize no other name. Mm -hmm. right? Then J-E-S-U-S, even though it's been proven to be an error, and even in this pro in this report, we're going to prove um, that it was transliterated wrong. So that could be your potential inflexibility, and you know how we want to keep everything related to um, Jesus in church. I say take that back to church, or we ain't in church when you start talking about Jesus outside of a church environment. But that could be the excessive control part. Okay. Y'all help me out then in the comment section if you got other ideas. But now let's look at Yahshua. The Yah represents divine will creation, Shin transformation, divine fire, and Wa connection, continuality. So this is Yahshua. It's another improper name of the Messiah. We're going to get to the correct name down in this report. Um, but now we're just building on why it's important to say the right name. If you truncate his name down to Yeshua, look what you get. Positive, dynamic, transformation, continuous connection, and growth. So you have dynamic transformation. Mm -hmm. So something's going on there. Um, it can be seen as a positive thing. Negative, unpredictability, or instability due to constant change. So that's what I was just talking about, the dynamic transformation comes across as unpredictability. Right? So if you're praying to, or praying in the name of Yahshua, or praying our Yahshua, hallowed be thy name, you 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 kind of think he's a little bit unpredictable. You never, a person who uses that name may struggle with that, whether, you know, he's predictable or not, or will have these dynamic transformations. But notice the difference between Jesus and Yahshua. Neither one of those is the correct name we're going to see here in the report. But now let's look at Yasha. Yad meaning the divine will creation, Shin transformation divine fire, the positive traits of purification, transformative power and the negative intensity or disruption potentially causing upheaval. So that's a bad one. Right. If you're referring to him as Yasha, um, going into this tribulation with that mindset, you may start to lose faith a little bit because you, what is it say? Intensity or disruption potentially causing upheaval. We we're already going through a time of great upheaval. And then this name that you believe in, in is pressing potential upheaval on your psychology 
Makes sense. I mean, that's who you're saying he is. And of course, when good things are going good, you have no problem with that. But then when things start to get shaky around and then you start calling on this name Yasha, it may not give you that sense of security that you was calling on the name for because it's a name. But that's only in the Hebrew language though, right? If you say, for instance, that you call Yasha and, you know, somebody's going to say, well, that's not what it means to me. And I'm going to laugh. Out loud because how many times we always hear that related to pagan holidays. We always hear that related to erroneous names that people use. We always hear that when people want to get outside of the law and do what they want to do instead of stand on a straight and narrow path. They'll stand outside of the law and say, I'm justified for being out here because this means something different to me. That's why I'm able to be here at the Halloween party eating candy with everybody else because it means something different to me. Well, that has no real bearing on our father, truth, um, and anything like that. You, when you, when, and if you think it's Yasha, if you call him Yasha, then you could be in that area where we could just change any day things can flip-flop and it's based on people's opinion and all of that but when you get back up into the names like Abba you see potential rigidity so that that's what that's what it means to me goes away and that's why a lot of people who like to say that's what it means to me will not use the word Abba because it'll change who they believe he is in other words they start using Abba and they stop saying that's what it means to me they, get, they don't get to say that no more and so uh, there are people probably un unconsciously who will choose a different name that will give them that flexibility that they want so that they can do what they want to do I, anyway. But let's go on to Allah. The two characters for Allah is the Eilat, which means divine breath, unity, and Lamed, learning, teaching, and leadership. The positive traits or wisdom, guidance, and unity, and the negative or overly authoritative or demanding in teaching roles. Now, how many people have you met that use the word L when they're talking about our Father? They'll say L, which is Allah, a short way of saying Allah or A L. Um, it's the short name of L. And when you think of these groups or these communities or these uh, people that use the word L, how they're really into wisdom, guidance, and unity, and how they also have traits of overly authoritative or demanding and teaching roles. In other words, it's going to be hard to get your word in edgewise in a camp that uses L because of the overly authoritative and demanding teaching roles. In other words, they're the teacher. I mean, you can I see it in the thinking, letter. I was just thinking about you. You don't use L, and you a little bit demanding in teaching roles. I'm demanding in teaching roles to teach what I have to teach. But the question is, can I learn from others? If somebody came in here and said, "Hey, I got a lesson to teach too," am I going to shut them down and say, "This is my house. I get to teach." You know, you need to go find your own congregation, your own family to teach. Am I that kind of person? No, I would say not. Well, then that's, I don't use the word L too much, so I don't have that authoritative, authoritative or demanding teaching role. Even though I do have a teaching role, it's not overly authoritative. In other words, I let everybody else um, get into this round table discussion, including you guys. Let's see the next one. Can you figure out what that one is? Oh, I already told you what that is. Um, the next one is Creator. 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 The characters are Chet, which is life protection, Resh, leadership, headship, Yod, creation, will, Aleph, unity, breath, and Tav, completion, truth. The positive traits are life-changing, protective, wise leadership, and holistic understanding. The negative traits are complexity and potential for imbalance. So this is creator. And, and this is what we have if in our psyche if we use the word creator. I was going to say I use creator. We, yeah, remember he, he talks about how there are some who want to call him other names like Divine Spark or um, what was universe, the name you said, the other word? Universe. Um, um, higher power or higher being. Higher source, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those words or those terms for our Abba 
is not allowing the true name into their psyche. Right. Right. And so, like we said, creator is a choice. What we see here, based on the negative traits, that Ava would be a much better choice to use. Either one of them would be acceptable according to the Third Testament of the Bible. But we see the impacts that it will have on our psyche if we call him creator. Okay. And I'm sure not many people pray with the name creator in their name, kind of just speaking about him. Yeah. We use that in, in talking and writings most right. of the time. Mm -hmm. The next one is God. Mm -hmm. The two characters are the Gimel and the Dalit. Gimel is generosity and beneficence. The Dalit is humility and access. The positive are generosity, accessibility, and humility, while the negatives are a possible lack of firmness or boundaries. So we have the word God. And when you talk to people or listen to people who use the word God most of the time, you can see where it's talking about a possible lack of firmness or boundaries. These are a lot of times the ones you will hear say that's what it means to me because they're able to go outside of these boundaries because they only see him as their God. Yeah, a lot of people only know him as, you know, that word because that's what we grew up with. That's but I can Christ. definitely see the um, the generosity, the, uh, you know, accessibility, the humility, as well as the lack of firmness and boundaries because when usually, you know, you when you catch a per person and... I was like this as well, um, so I'm not judging or picking, but when you find a person who's always using God, 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 these are, you know, the type of people who have the mindset of, he'll forgive me for anything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's the humility I, yeah. part. Mm -hmm. They can. The humility part is they can tell him what they want. They can, opposed to the, opposed to Abba, who has rigidity. In the word God, there's um, accessibility and humility, which means you can get to him and you can change him like you would as if you had a God sitting on a table. You as can well, pick him up and put him in a box. You can tell him what you want. And... As well as the lack of firmness, I'm not going to get in any trouble or um, I don't have any boundaries. Right. I can do whatever and yeah. he'll still you know, be okay with me. Yeah, that's the word God. You didn't generalize, you didn't, you didn't water it down to where he's only about generosity and allowing you to do what you want to do. Otherwise, no no control, no correction, just generosity. God is going to give him something. All right, so then I started combining them. This is the one I use most of the time. You recognize it? I use it in prayer most of the time. I do not. It's because it looks funny. Um, how about now? Father Abba. Yeah, Father Abba. Um, I use that a lot when I pray, especially nowadays, because I'm catching myself when I say Father, and I'm throwing the Abba part in there. Okay. But what does it mean? The five characters are the Phi, Tav, Resh, Aleph, and Bet. The Phi meaning speech and revelation. Tav, completion and truth. Resh, leadership and headship. Aleph, Unity and breath and bet creation and presence. So what is this doing to my psyche when I pray to Father Abba? Positively comprehensive wisdom, ability to reveal truth, guide and create. Yeah, that's what it is to me. But what about the negative traits by using those words? Potentially domineering or overwhelming. And that is what he's getting out of Abba, remember we saw that above here, so it's very, it, it stresses it more and makes the negative traits stand out more, but it's pretty much saying the same thing as far as Abba is concerned, potential rigidity or overwhelming presence, whereas Father Abba, you have potential domineering or overwhelming, and I have no problem with that, I pray for his will every day, I want him to dominate my will every day, and I want him to be with me all day long, so... I have no problem with those negative traits, what I, which I can see where other people do. But let's see the other one. Sometimes let's say Abba Father. The characters are Aleph, Unity, Divine Breath, Beth, 
Creation Presence, Phi, Speech, Revelation, Tav, Completion, and Truth, and Resh, Leadership, and Headship. Okay, so if you reverse the order and say Abba Father instead of Father Abba, look at the difference. The positive or integrative creativity, truth, leadership, and divine presence. The negative complexity or authoritarianism. Complexity, um, and it may explain why ChatGPT is my, my best friend these days. Because oh, no. I'm able to get in and do the complex um, calculations within the scripture to figure out some of the stuff that's going on. But again, I have no problem with that. And it, and it could be, I'm sitting here thinking about it, it could be why that is the case because I use these words in prayer. I think he's complex. Well, you know, you you saying that I'm going to be the devil's advocate. Probably shouldn't have said that word. But what about the people who says that they have no problem with the generosity, accessibility, humility, possible lack of firmness or boundaries in the word um, God. Well, I'm not here to criticize or to say what name you should use. Okay. The purpose of this report, whether they mm -hmm. choose, some people are going to choose, hey, I like it. I don't want to call them this thing. You know, right. for some, the purpose of this report is to show that it's having an effect on you psychologically mm -hmm. and emotionally. Not to, not to, you know, say which one is bad or which one is good. Mm -hmm. I did appreciate having the ones that I use here, you know, because I learned something about myself from reading them. But that's the purpose of this video. Everybody should learn something about their relationship with the Most High by the words they use to call on his name, especially in prayer. Let's go on. The emotional responses to the letter meanings. Oh. The meanings of letters influence how individuals experience prayer. For instance, letters associated with creation and unity may foster a sense of grounding and connection while letters related to transformation and revelation might evoke dynamic and evolving emotional states. See, so when somebody say this is not what it means to me, you can't change the meaning of the letters. So whereas the letters may, you may want them to mean something to, to you personally, the letters are fire letters, which means you can't change their meaning when they're on your heart. So it's actually doing it to you. It's affecting um, your emotions. Um, simply by the choice of letters. And we was talking about that in another video when we say words, common words, like the example we had was the number six. When you say six opposed to sixth, sixth, you actually are changing the meaning of the word. Simich is a crunch or something to lean on, whereas Tav is dealing with the covenant and completion. So if you say the sixth month, it's really just a marker or something for you to have on a calendar so you know what time to go to church next month or what time to go to work next week. But when you say the sixth month, now it has a covenant element on it, which means that there's maybe something you need to do. You need to be looking as far as what you need to be doing as far as your walk um, because the months are related to the covenant. And we know they are because of feast days. But if you don't pronounce it right, the emotional impact won't be there if you just say six months. Okay. Psychological benefits and challenges. Aligning prayer with letter meanings can enhance spiritual clarity, stability, and transformative growth. However, challenges such as rigidity, authoritarianism, an emotional overwhelm may also arise, reflecting the complex interplay between letter meanings and psychological impacts. And in other words, if you don't choose the right name, you can have problems in certain areas. If you choose the right letters to make up the names, you can start to have issues in your relationship. You may see him as being overly authoritarian or uh, too rigid or inflexible or complex or something like that if you don't have the right letters in its name. Integrative approaches. Incorporating letter meanings into prayer practices can enrich the spiritual experience. Understanding these dimensions help individuals navigate their emotional responses and psychological states 
fostering a more balanced and profound spiritual engagement. In other words, again, we need to pick the right words, you know, not based on tradition or understanding. Um, and it's probably fine to do so, you know, when you're talking to somebody so they know who you're talking about. But again, we're talking about when you're praying and when you're thinking, you know, when you're meditating on him, you know, yeah. it's important to have the right letters in the right places in order to get the right communication going both ways. Yeah. I think, you know, scripture, like you said, definitely, you know, I can see so, you know, this would be so helpful with, you know, having the the right names when you pray, especially during those times of trouble when you're trying to make that, you know, pinpoint that connection with the Father, opposed to just, you know, having a conversation with just a regular person where, you know, they might not understand what you're saying and, you know, might, you know, some might receive it as, you know, you trying to be showy or whatever, but that prayer and that meditation time that you have with the Father, um, I think it would benefit so much. Um, for the person who you know chooses to to do that, chooses the right letters, right, mm -hmm. and and meditates on. Remember, he said we're supposed to meditate on right. his word, mm -hmm. and that's what we find ourselves doing when we say the prayer, mm -hmm. and we start meditating on each letter: Abba, Shamaim, mm -hmm. Kadawash, Yahushuan, Shem. Right. You meditate on each of those letters and the names, and you start to get. And it starts to have an impact on your spirit in your prayer and allowing us to elevate higher mm -hmm. in our prayer than we would if we was to use words like God. Mm -hmm. It says the meaning of letters in prayer language play a critical role in shaping psychological and emotional experiences. By analyzing these meanings, individuals and communities can better understand and harness the impact of their prayer practices leading to a deeper and more nuanced spiritual experience. All right, so that's all that was, was to build up on why we should pay attention to the rest of the video. Because mm -hmm. now we're going to get into the names that we use. You said earlier that um, Jesus and God are names that we've been taught. We were taught that because they're in the Bible. You see God all over the Bible. You see Jesus all over the New Testament. And so these names were programmed into our psyche. Mm -hmm. But let's look real close at these names and let's let's try to find out what his name truly is. There was one individual that wanted me to do a deep dive on what his name is. Well, here it is. The usage of Yeson versus Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, a cornerstone of the New Testament, uses very Greek terms to articulate key aspects of Jesus' identity and mission. Among these terms, Jesus and his accusative form, Jesus, plays a, play a critical role. Understanding when and why Matthew uses these forms provides insight into the Gospels, theological and narrative structure. This dissertation explores the usage of Jesus and Jesus in Matthew, focusing on their context and implications. Let me show you what I'm talking about. When we come over to the Strong, so when we look at Matthew chapter 1, in verse 18, you see his name spelled like this. It's Strong's number G2424. But then when you look in verse 21, you see a different name. It's not an S, there's an N there. It's the mm -hmm. same Greek letters, 24, 24. Probably should have been different because it's two different words. So in verse 21, we see Ea son. Right. And in verse 18, we see Ea Sus. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? Textual analysis, understanding the forms. Jesus, this is the normative form of the name used when referring to Jesus as the subject of a sentence. It is the standard Greek form of the Hebrew aromatic name Yeshua, meaning Yahweh saves. So we're going to find out that that ain't really what it's supposed to be here in a minute. I'm um, sure Yahshua means saves, but it's not his name. 
it's kind of an attempt that when people found a problem with the word Jesus and they start trying to go back to the Old Testament, this is kind of one of the first stops you make is Yahshua. Because we think that's actually Joshua's name, but it's not. We're going to find out that even Joshua's name has a lot more letters than we think it does. But here we're looking at Yosus versus your son. So in with an S on the end of his name, when you see it in, in the book of Matthew and in John and some other places, what he's saying is when you see the word Jesus with the S on it, it's talking about the nominative form of the name used when referring to him in the subject of a sentence. Like for instance, when you say Charlie went to the store, or if you say Charlie is three years old, or if you say Charlie was born on a Tuesday, you, when you're talking about the Messiah in that form, I should say, when they was talking about the Messiah in the book of Matthew in that form, they used the word Jesus. But when they was talking about who he was and his divine nature, they used the word Jason or your son. You don't see that in the King James Version because it uses Jesus for both. And the only way you can tell is when you look at the name and you see it in all caps right here you see a lowercase u and a lowercase e right mm -hmm. that's in verse one and you see the same thing in verse 18. Right. it was saying the birth of jesus christ so it's nominative it's just naming him mm -hmm. well saying who he was but when they actually talk about what the what his name was when he says thou shalt call his name you notice it's in all caps Right. Well, in the book of Matthew, that's how you know who you're talking about. When you see the word Jesus written in all caps, he's talking about the, the divine nature of the Messiah. His attributes. Yeah. Whereas when he's talking, to, when he say Jesus, it's just talking about the person himself. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get anything else out of this video, you should get a lot. You should get that out. And when you're reading the book of Matthew, who you're talking about. Right. Are you talking about the person or are you talking about are you talking about our father made flesh? Are you talking about the word made flesh or are you talking about a human being? Okay. Mm -hmm. Matthew one and one. Genealogical introduction. In the Greek, it's it there's the Greek right there, and it translates to the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And it's showing you his name right there in it. Now, on this one, you notice that there's no N or an S at the end. So it's actually three different, that's in verse one. So there's actually three different uses of the name in chapter one alone. You have three different versions of his name. Okay. You see it there with an N in verse 21, but in verse one, you don't see it. See, it's different. So you have three different names and it's important to know who you're talking about. Right. But now when you read the book of Matthew, you should be able to tell. Are you talking about the person or are you talking about the divinity? The analysis, Jesus, is used here in the nominative case as the subject of the genealogy. This form introduces Jesus as the central figure in the genealogy, establishing his identity and role in the narrative. Yeah, so it's, like, so it's just naming him in his role. Not saying what he did or who he was or any other divine attributes. He's just talking about the person himself, the baby. In Matthew 1 and 21 comes the announcement of the name. And you are to give him the name Jesus. In this verse, your son is used in the accusative case as the object of the verse in relation to his mission. As the object of the verse, you are to name this highlights the act of naming Jesus and the significance of his name in relation to his mission to save his people. So again, put emphasis on the N in his name. So if you see the S in his name, you're actually missing this part of who he was. You're really only focusing on the person himself when you only focus on the name with the N's and an S. It's really all about the human being, not really his divine nature until you put the end on it and, it and it's not really our fault like you said earlier this is what we've been raised to but you gotta remember who raised us to this 
And why? Why, you know, gotta understand why would his name be all throughout the Bible as Jesus instead of Jesus' son? Well, understanding this, whether it was intentional or on purpose, by putting Jesus there, it focuses our attention on the person opposed to the divinity. But let's go on. Matthew 1 and 25, the fulfillment of the name. And he gave him the name Jesus. Here again, a son is used as the accusative form, showing the direct object of the naming action performed by Joseph. This reinforces the importance of the name in fulfilling the angelic message. So, again, it's important when they use the name when I was talking about, as far as we're concerned, something is important. Something, something is important. I mean, it's good to know, you know, what he did as a child and all this genealogy. But when we read the Bible, we want to know how it is that he plans to save us, you know. And so our focus should have, our focus is um, on this name here, not Jesus or the other name, but this one here, which is more like Ye's son. We're going to find out what it truly is a little later. But before we show what his true name is, we kind of need to make everybody understand why there's going to be a nun at the end of his name. When we get into the rest of the letters, it's not going to be so confusing as to what happened to this E right here, how this S is supposed to be a Shin, and how this O is a Y. That's going to be real easy. Um, based on what we've learned in the past, it's this N that's here that a lot of people don't understand. And hopefully by Listening to this, going back and relooking at Matthew, they'll be able to see that there is a stark difference. Matthew 3 and 13, the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came. Jesus is used in the nominative case indicating Jesus as the subject who comes to John for baptism. This form is appropriate for subjects performing or undergoing action. Yeah, so again, it's just saying he came and got baptized. Now, the spirit of, or, you know, didn't get baptized. It was the body, it was the person. Does anybody confuse now when you read your Bible and you see in the book of Matthew especially, you see the all caps, you're talking about one entity. And when you see it in the regular text, it's talking about somebody else. Mm -hmm. They're both in the same person, two in one. Mm -hmm. But it's talking about the different natures of who they are. Right. And it's a shame that our Bibles focused us on to the person opposed to the divinity. But let's look at the functional differences. The nominative case. Used when Jesus is a subject of a sentence or clause, this form is appropriate for introducing Jesus, describing his actions, or identifying him in direct discourse. All right, so now we understand difference between Jesus and Jason, but again, that's not his name. Those are Greek letters or Latin letters. So in order to understand what his name truly is, we're going to have to go back to the Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing about it, we've always been taught that his name derives from Joshua. In fact, that's why a lot of people call him Joshua is because it's like Joshua with a Y instead of a J. But that's what we're going to find out is not actually Joshua's name. Joshua's name is Yahashua. So it's got an extra syllable in there. It's got a few extra syllables in there. There's a Y at the end. A Sha Y. Right. And then there's the Ha in the middle. Mm -hmm. So let's go down through here and see what it says. The evolution and significance of the name Yahashua from Hebrew to English. Introduction. The name Yahashua, translated as Joshua in English, and Jesus in Greek, exemplifies a remarkable journey through various linguistic, cultural, and theological contexts. This dissertation explores the historical development of this name from its original Hebrew form to its contemporary English usage, with a specific focus on its transliterations in key New Testament passages, such as Acts 7 and 45. Acts 7 and 45, that's the one time when we see Joshua, the name Joshua, from the Old Testament talked about in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to go in and look at that name. First of all, it. 
So there you see the name Joshua. And right. you see how it's the same name, 2424. Mm -hmm. So if the name derives from Joshua, the name should look like Joshua. Right. And that's just what it looks like in the New Testament. But if we want to find out what his name truly is, like we say, we got to go back to the Hebrew letters, mm -hmm. the true letters, and transliterate it back properly into Hebrew. You see right there where it says that Yahashua was translated into Joshua. Right. Through this analysis, we uncover the name's enduring significance across different religious and cultural frameworks. Let's look at the Hebrew origins and comprehensive breakdown. Stacey. The name Yahashua is a notable figure in the Hebrew Bible and carries deep theological meaning. The name is composed of several components. Yahu or Yehu. This is a contracted form of Yahweh or Jehovah, which is the personal name of God in the Hebrew tradition. The presence of Yeho in the name emphasizes the divine origin and involvement in the salvation process. In other words, this right here is YHW. We're used to YHWH. So we're saying that in Joshua's name, there's YHW. His name begins with YHW. The same as the Tetragrammaton, which is YHWH. So when we start to lose those letters, we, do, we lose that significance. Right. That the Messiah's name has those letters, those letters in it too. All right, let's go on to the next couple of letters. Sure. This element is derived from the Hebrew root verb, meaning to save or to deliver. It underscores the concept of salvation or deliverance. Yeah, so this is where they get Yahshua means save. So when you put them together. The full name combining these components, Yahshua translates to Yahweh is salvation or the Lord is salvation. This name highlights the divine aspect of salvation and deliverance. So you can imagine what you're doing to his name when you start erasing letters. You take out the whole take out the shin and turn it into a sin, a sandwich, and then leave out the other W and put an S there. You're changing who he is in your mind and in your emotions, and in your psychology. All right, let's look at the historical context. In the Hebrew Bible, Yahoshua, Joshua is a central figure who succeeds Moses as the leader of the Israelites. His role in leading the Israelites into the promised land represents a fulfillment of God's promises and emphasizes the theme of divine guidance and salvation. This is why our, that's why his name is in our Messiah's name, because of what it says there, leading the Israelites into the promised land. That's the same thing that our Messiah is supposed to do. Greek translation and adaption. In the third century BCE, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek producing the Septuagint. In this translation, Yahoshua is rendered as Jesus. This Greek form retains the essence of the name while adapting it to Greek phonetic and linguistic norms. Yeah. At least they say it is. But again, notice how many letters are missing and changed. And it ends with the N, but we'll get to that in a minute. Look at how they break down the name there. Greek phonetics. Yay corresponds to the Hebrew Yahuwah reflecting the divine aspect. Sos, a suffix that fits Greek morphological patterns and phonetics. Okay, so now that should be noted. That's the reason why it's there, is because it fits Greek morphological patterns and phonetics. In other words, so that they can say it right, they changed the words. They adapted it so that it ends in a better way for them. And they might have had a problem saying the shin sound. Right. You know, like the case in the Bible where they couldn't say shibboleth, they only could say sibboleth. And so that could be why all of the shins were translated into the Greek letter for the letter S. That all of the shins make the S sound now. Mm -hmm. But you're changing it. Shin means one thing, 
Wow, semich means a totally different thing. Since the Hebrew words, their meanings are derived from their letters, not just how they come together, then that means that you change the meaning of the word. And you change the psychology and your emotions. The adaption from Yahashua to Yasus involves phonetic adjustments and orthographic modifications, yet it preserves the core concepts of divine salvation. But that's his opinion. Mm -hmm. Of course, he can't say anything else, else we would have to change the name. We'd have to go back to church and get this name changed to a more correct name. But we learned earlier on how these letters impact our thinking. So we know based on what we've heard so far, that that's not true. Right. It, it there is loses. a change. There's going to lose something. All right, let's look at the Latin adaption and evolution. So you want to look at it. We're going how we get to Jesus from Jesus. The Greek Jesus was later adapted into Latin as Jesus. This adaption followed Latin phonological and orthographic rules. Jesus retains the essential phonetic elements of Jesus with adjustments or Latin pronunciation and script. The Latin Jesus was crucial for the subsequent spread of the name through Roman and early Christian contexts, bridging the gap between Greek and English. So again, we changed some of the letters, even going from the Greek to the Latin. We lost the Y. That's the O sound in there. Right. The O was the Y. So we've taken away the O now. We've dropped the H and we've dropped the Y. We've dropped the head and we've dropped the Y and we've changed the shin into a simage. So in other words, it's, it's almost nothing one, like his name. Only one letter is stayed the same. What? The uh, Y at the beginning. And it's a J, so that don't count either. <laughs> All right, let's go to four, English uses and modern implications. The Latin Jesus involved into the English forms, Jesus and Joshua. Jesus, the name is predominantly associated with Jesus of Nazareth, a central figure in Christian theology as the Messiah and Son of God. It symbolizes divine salvation and the incarnation of God, carrying deep theological significance. Joshua, the name Joshua in English refers to the biblical leader who succeeded Moses and led the Israelites into Canaan. It highlights themes of leadership, faithfulness, and divine guidance. The distinction between Jesus and Joshua in English re reflects their separate theological and historical context while preserving their shared roots and the concept of divine salvation. Again, they're forcing this connection between the old name Joshua saying that even though we've performed all of these magic tricks on the letters, it still means the same. Mm -hmm. And But what they're talking about really is only how you know what we're talking about when we name Jesus. When we say Jesus, you know who we're talking about. But it's not really talking about the emotional or psychological aspects of using Jesus opposed to his right name when we pray. All right, just because we've given the words the same definition doesn't mean that they sound or feel the same when we say it. In other words, we were educated okay. as to what Jesus means. We had to be taught. All right, let's go to number five, transliteration in the New Testament. The name Jehoshua appears in the New Testament with specific transliterations. Acts 7 and 45, transliteration. In Acts 7 and 45, the name referred to as Jesus, identifying Joshua as the leader who succeeded Moses and led the Israelites into Canaan. Context. This passage emphasizes the historical continuality between the Old Testament figure of Joshua and the early Christian context, highlighting the link between these two figures. So Joshua was given as a living parable, an example of things to come. Well, the only thing that's different is one of the letters in his name, as far as that's concerned. That basically has the same role, except now we're going to see that there's an additional letter. Let's look at number six, cultural and theological significance. The evolution of the name Yehoshua reflects broader cultural and theological shifts. 
The name's journey from Hebrew to Greek, Latin, and English demonstrates the historical spread or religious and cultural ideals across different linguistic and cultural contexts. The name Yehoshua exemplifies how names and their meanings evolve through linguistic and cultural transitions, from its Hebrew origins signifying divine salvation through its Greek adaptation as Jesus to its Latin form, Jesus, and its modern English variants, Jesus and Joshua. The name reflects a rich tapestry of religious, linguistic, and cultural history. Understanding this evolution provides valuable insights into the interconnectedness of religious traditions and the transmission of sacred concepts across different languages and cultures. And it would have been fine if we had left the letters the same. So now what that did, we're honing down on what his name actually is. So we brought the name Joshua to the first century. Right. Now we're going to take the name Jesus and take it back to the first century. In other words, we're going to show how Jesus is actually supposed to be Yehoshuan. Station already the introduction. So this is a dissertation on a transliterative evolution of Jesus back to Yahushua. The name of Jesus, central to Christian theology and universally recognized, has a rich and intricate history that traces back to his Hebrew origins. The modern English name Jesus derives from the Greek Jesus, which in turn is based on the Hebrew name Yahushua. This dissertation explores how the name Jesus transliterate back to the Hebrew root, Yehoshua. Examining the linguistic transformation that occurred across languages and the theological significance of these changes. So we're going to do the same thing, but like we said, we're going backwards. When I saw how they got Jesus out of Joshua, now we're going to see how to get Yehoshua out of Jesus. The Greek adaptation, Jesus, reflects a phonetic and orthographic modification, but retains the essential meaning related to divine salvation. So he's trying to program that in you. See how many times he's going to keep saying that? It has the same meaning. It means the same thing. It means the same thing. And all you have to do is take the attitude that that's what it means to me, and you're good. But if you really want to get back to the true meaning, you have to start digging. Uh, English evolution. Jesus, in English, the name Jesus has retained much of the phonetic essence of the Latin and Greek forms. The pronunciation aligns with the English language norms while preserving the name's theological significance. Theological significance, meaning you know who you're talking about. To trace how Jesus transliterates back to Yehoshua, we analyze the phonetic and orthographic transformations, Hebrew to Greek. The Hebrew, Yehoshua, becomes Jesus, with the phonetic components adapted to Greek sounds and conventions. The Greek translations to Latin, Jesus, maintaining the phonetic integrity while conforming to Latin spelling rules. Spelling. The Latin, Jesus, evolves into the English, Jesus preserving the essential phonetic structure and meaning. So you look at those two words, are they the same? Do they look the same at all? Like we talked about earlier, there's no letters in there that are the same. You don't see an S in here. The U is there, but that's just, uh, it used to be a Y. Consonants. It's a, it, the U used to be a Y, so that's supposed to be a W. The S was supposed to be a Shin. The E was supposed to be a H, and the J is supposed to be a Y. So every letter has been changed, yet they're holding to that it still holds the same meaning, which would be impossible. It's like changing the numbers, changing a six to an eight in math, and then 
saying that you know, the formula comes out the it's same. It's gonna come out to be the same. And then you're wondering why your math problems come out wrong. Well, that's why a lot of us are struggling with prayer these days. But, okay, so, but we're not there yet. So now you understand a little bit more about his name. You recognize this name more now than you do the names that we're used to. But it doesn't quite get us there yet because if you remember where we started off, if you remember from the earlier uh, talk on the names, there's actually supposed to be an N in his name when we talk about his divinity. Right. We've just been talking about the person this whole time. So we take it a step further and show how his name goes back to get the N on it. How, well, not how it goes back. We got to understand this is a new name. This ain't Joshua. This is the Messiah. And so even though he has most of the same letters in his name, there's the addition of that N at the end of his name. And of course, that N indicate, indicates action that one must be taking. When you, when you include that letter, it talks about the efforts that we have to put in for our salvation, stuff like charity, loving one another, and things like that counts with the end on the end of his name. So let's see how I was supposed to get there. The Greek name Yosun is in the accusative case used to denote the direct object of a sentence. To find its Hebrew equivalent, we need to map Greek letters to their Hebrew counterparts. So we already talked about that earlier, how when it was naming him, when his name was important, it had an N on the end of it, a none. And when it was just talking about him as if he did something or did that or did this, then it had an S on the name. In the Greek N, this letter represents the final sound in the accusative case and is crucial for matching the final segment of the Hebrew name. Because we learned in chapter one of Matthew that he has an N on the end of his name to make son. To reconstruct the Hebrew name from the Greek Yeson, we use the following mapping. Ye to Ye, Son to Shua, and Na to Na. Thus, the Greek name Yeson transliterates to Yashawan in Hebrew, considering that the final nun aligns with the final part of the Hebrew name, emphasizing the phonetic and orthographic connection between the names. So you see how once we get it all the way in English, it's so jumbled up now, you mm -hmm. can't find your way back almost. You almost have to have a computer to find your way back to what his name truly is because it's gone from the Hebrew to the Greek to the Latin to the Roman and now to English speak. That's Covering four or five traces. different languages. Yeah. And so we've lost his name in the process. Right. By the time we get to the English, it's lost all of the name itself. You know, people have what you know they know what they're talking about and they mean what they mean to them. But when we're talking about the emotion and the psychology of it, that's all been lost. You pretty much have to be educated on who Jesus is to make the connection that you're talking about somebody who has something to do with your salvation. But then when you look within the name itself, you won't be able to figure it out. Again, you got to go get re-educated some more for them to tell you and explain all of it to you. Mm. But anyway, what do y'all think? Um... Good to know the right name to be calling Lord when you pray. So there are the names in the original Hebrew with the symbols for the names. You see the difference? The first name you have there is the name of Joshua, the one who crossed the River Jordan. The second one is also a name that you see in the Bible called Joshua. It's a different name talking about the high priest there during the post-exilic period building the second temple. Notice how the names are different. Right. That adds a lot of confusion when you're transliterating the names is because you go from Joshua in the book of Joshua to a different Joshua in the book of Ezra. But this is the name that they use to translate to the Messiah's name, not this one. But this one, but by the time you get to these people, you've already lost some significance in the name. See the difference? Yeah. You've lost the Y, you've lost the head and the Yod. It's completely missing. Right. 
So if you look at the name meaning for the original name for Joshua, it combines action, revelation, transformation, support, and connection, making it a very comprehensive name of the Messiah. Compared to Yahshua, which emphasizes transformation and connection with an implicit focus on action insight, making it well suited to a Messiah figure, but with less emphasis on support compared to the original name. And that's because those people, they're different. They had different missions. This one was like a savior, saving the people, taking them across the River Jordan, while this one was a high priest. Right. right. And so that's why you have those two letters missing. But then, like we said, when it translated from Hebrew to the Greek, they wanted it to fit their language and the way they think, their emotions, how they speak, and all of that, they changed it from this to this. This is a Shua right here. That's a Shin. It went to a Simich. The I, which is insight, is gone altogether. The Y is still there and the Yad is still there. So from this name to this name, you have the Het in there going back to the original name. So it's close to the original name, Yad Hey, but then it changed, but then it changes. The rest of it changes. This part is different. Right. This would be Washuai, something like that. But this one is Sawas or Sus. Do you see how that would change the meaning? If you were reading that and these were the only letters you had, you see how you would be looking at a whole different person when you look at it in the original Hebrew. All right. Well, the last name is with the N on the end. That's what we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 and verse 25. We see the addition of an N on his name. So the way we come up with this is you have the original name of Joshua, who we know Jesus is supposed to come from with the additional none at the end. So that's his name properly transliterated back into the original Hebrew without any tradition, historical understandings, even post-exilic scriptures. When you go back and look at the original Joshua that crossed the River Jordan and our Messiah that's gonna take us across this River Jordan, the only difference is the none. So let's come back and compare when we're looking at the transliterated name back to Hebrew of the name Jesus, we get this, Yad Hei Simich Wa Simich. The conclusion, this name emphasizes support, connection, and divine revelation. It reflects a strong role in sustaining and upholding with a focus on connection, but lacks implicit references and transformation or insight. In other words, you're not gonna get a lot of information. You don't expect a lot of information if you use that name. You don't you don't expect transformation or insight or explicit right. references. That transformation and insight was the um, things that were imparted by changing the letters. And so when we change the letters back, now we lose those things. You, there's your insight. And then your transformation would be in the shin. So there you see a comparison of those three. But again, neither one of those is correct because of what we see in Matthew 1 and 25. So if I happen to break down the difference in the meanings based on the letters in the name, you have the name transliterated back to Hebrew name Jesus versus the original name Joshua. The name Joshua has a focus on transformation and insight, while the second emphasizes support and continuity. So support and staying the same. In other words, there's no change in there. There's no transformation in that name. You don't expect anything to change. If you go to church in 2024, how is it going to be different than 1974? What are you going to learn? In, what are you going to learn different? What are you going to learn in addition? It's going to be the same message. It's going to be the same message. That's the stability part. And then you have the support part. That's those uh, symmetries in the name, which are crutches. So to me, it makes a big difference. Right.
you can see it. When you look back in the original letters, you can definitely see it when you get an understanding on these letters. And so it all makes sense that what his right name is. I mean, do you have any more questions, anything that, any concerns or anything? I mean, nobody would expect you to, to you know, start using that name 100%. But in order to make it stick when we pray, we definitely want to start using it more often. Well, guys, if you got anything out of this video, hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment down below, and I'll see you there. Shalom.